Do you think I have an aphid problem? Here's another video on aphids. Uh, I'm going to take it to the next level here. We're going to talk about aphid and plant interactions as well as how the predators fit in there. I'm David Spencer. Welcome to Gardening with Bugs. So I'm sitting in front of a, a part of the yard that I'm, I'm not particularly pleased to share with you, but I'm, go I'm going to just because I'm, I, I want to prove a point here. And um, actually, it's not completely neglected. This was a, a cut greens bed. And then when the heat of the summer came on there, I switched to things like flax and other um, hot season crops. Um, and then as, as the year progressed, I, I reseeded it with some lettuces, but I also intentionally put some mustards in there in the mix. Now remember, um, so this big tall guy here is uh, like seed mustard. Like you might, you might um, know it as white mustard. Um, keep in mind that mustards, they're, they're part of the they're they're brassicas basically like brassicas and uh, things like bok choy and mustard and turnips and all those things they're all kind of, they're all loosely related um so when we talk about mustard you could have all sorts of like the edible green mustards as well um, but this one this particular plant is seed mustards or white mustard now i put it here for a very specific reason and that is because elsewhere on the property i'm growing brassicas that i really care about some of them are my Brussels sprouts that I've been growing since uh, basically February or March, maybe last year. They've been in the garden and they're, they're just fruiting now or, or producing the Brussels that I want, um, as well as kale that I'm going to be overwintering. So these are plants that I want to protect. Now by planting this here, but these flowering mustards, I'm doing a couple things. I'm providing habitat for pests of brassicas, bear with me, uh, but also providing a place for the predators of those pests to establish in my yard. And that is key for pest prevention on this scale. Okay, this is not practiced typically in massive greenhouse operations because the risk of inviting a predator is just too great. There's too many variables here. Outside in, a, in an organic yard with, with wild land all over the place, um, this, is a, this is a very safe procedure to do. But I also want to draw close attention to what's going on in the mustards right now. So the mustard I showed at the beginning here, it is absolutely covered in the cabbage aphid. Like I'm, I'm a bit shocked. I've never seen one so like head to toe coated in this particular aphid. Um, but immediately next to it is one that is not. And unfortunately the wind kind of picked up and there's a bit of rain. Um, so I, I'm going to show you some uh, videos of hoverflies I took actually the day before. But typically that this entire bed is just swarming with hoverflies. Now, what I want to point out is that there's a bunch of things going on. Yes, ho so hoverflies, I'm talking about a uh, fitophagus hoverflies, so aphid eating hoverflies. And that's most of the species that you're familiar with are, are probably aphid eating. There's a quite a few that eat like detritus and stuff like that as well. But the ones that you're going to see in a garden like this flying around, they look like bees, right? They're yellow and black usually or, or black and white striped. Um, but very obviously not bees because they have big bulbous eyes, tiny little antennas, forked feet, um, and only the two wings. So that's how you can distinguish them from something that's going to sting you basically. These guys will not sting you. They are just pollinators but their larvae eat aphids. So they're attracted to two things, the flowering plant because they need nectar and they need pollen in order to, to produce eggs, but also they're attracted to a plant that is infected by aphids, not just because of the presence of aphids, but because the plant is producing a volatile, a smell that's detectable by these insects. Now this is not really new science. Um, it's, it's now, a a bit more widely um, widely being looked at because it turns out most plants produce um, similar volatiles where really we just thought it was consistent with a couple plants but really almost every plant will exhibit a volatile when it's under attack from a pest now typically it needs something like you tearing a leaf um, a caterpillar biting out of it for the plant to harden off cause its own internal reaction to the pest and then produce a chemical scent that will warn other plants believe it or not they actually communicate this way a plant that's not touching it, it's not touching my roots or anything like that a plant downwind from it 
will pick up this volatile and harden itself off against the pest as well. Now what's really amazing is all these things have evolved together. So when the plant under attack by aphids exhibits this self-defense mechanism, it hardens itself off the aphids, becomes less um, appropriate for the aphids um, and less desirable. So a plant that's not under attack by aphids, but has picked up this volatile, has had the plant interaction, will be very, will dissuade aphids from attacking it. But remarkably, it's the predators of aphids and predators of, of other pests as well that pick up on the smell and go to that plant. So it's as if the plant, not only is it producing this chemical to warn others of the attack, but it's producing it to attract predators to help clean up the aphid problem. So that is why it's not all that surprising to see an aphid population on a mustard like this next to a plant that's totally clean and an abundance of aphid predators. So this is one of those things you need to look for in the garden for whether or not you need to treat aphids because like I'll always, I'll always tell you how you can treat aphids because I know it's, it's something you're concerned about but really the bottom line and even the, the foremost aphid researchers in the world will say the best thing you can do with aphids is, is always leave them because their population just it's meant to explode but they feed so many predators that by having those predators there, it's always the best way to prevent other aphid infestations from getting to an economic threshold. So we're not talking about eliminating aphids, they have to exist, but it's that big population of aphids that's gonna produce a large amount of predators that's gonna prevent aphids elsewhere in your yard from getting to those peak populations which are causing you stress in your garden. So yes, if this was an important plant and I've got aphids all over it and oh, I need to sell it or whatever, I need to show it off at my garden club, then of course you, just, you rinse them off with water or do whatever. And if it's a plant you want to eat, just rinse them off. It, like, it doesn't hurt you to eat them anyways, but, um, but of course you wash them off. It doesn't really change the plant, except that we just talked about how a plant can harden itself off to aphids. Do you, you can get in some plant species um, basically different tastes out of it. It can become quite bitter or something like that to, to dissuade animals from eating it. Uh, so maybe it's gonna affect the taste of your, of your plant. And that's actually important about plant volatiles. We now know enough about plant volatiles that we can um, explore them, synth synthetically produce some of them and then expose plants to them to protect against pests. But the reason why we're not commercially doing that is because there's a cost associated with that. The plants don't want to be under that kind of stress. It takes a lot of their energy to produce these volatiles. So eventually it wears off and the plant becomes stressed as well. It's almost like it's, it could be sacrificing itself in a way. It has this aphid infestation. It's gonna expend a whole bunch of energy to try to fight that thing off. It's gonna hope that predators arrive to help it out. Otherwise, by sending its signal out to the others, it's the others that will survive. So aphid management in a yard like mine, where I'm not using chemicals, I've got a variety of plants, I don't have a, an economic threshold of a, of a major crop that I need to get to market, um, and I'm really just uh, flirting with like cut flowers for the, for the roadside stand in terms of, of a cosmetic threshold, and then um, you know a bit of tolerance, especially when the plants are young, I obviously have to care a little bit more about the aphids, but, but aphid management for me in this yard is, is leaving it. And it's, there's top scientists all over the world that, that have proven that the best way to manage aphids is to leave them alone. Um, like a perfect example, I just got back from a conference about aphids in Spain, and they found that boulevard trees are the ornamental trees planted within, this, within a city. So there's no, like, there's no native habitat kicking around. Uh, boulevard trees or trees in parks and stuff like that, they were assessing all the different species of aphids. There's like 140 different species but they were concerned about uh, the linden aphid on, on linden trees. And what they found was of all the different sprays, of releasing bios, of, of all the different things they could do in the controlled er area where they did nothing, more predators showed up. And then every year after that, it only got better. And it showed that the best control for aphids was to have done nothing in the first place. Now, of course, like I produce beneficial insects, so it's important for me to, at some point to try to sell them. But, but more important is that growers understand how little you need. Sometimes you have to boost the populations, especially in greenhouses, but almost always aphid control 
is just having tolerance for them and doing nothing. The plants are fighting off the infection, they're attracting predators, they're warning other plants. You really just have to decide what kind of tolerance you're going to have and then maybe just blast them off with water when they get to a, to a point where you're uncomfortable with it. But I encourage you to plant these plants that will be habitat for aphids and aphid predators in your yard. Now if you don't want to plant mustard because the cabbage aphid on the mustard is transferable to the, the other cabbages that you have in your property, that's fine. I've got a whole bunch of other solutions for you. Grow hops. Hops get a hop aphid and the hop aphid is not transferable to any other plants that you'd typically be growing. Uh, there's a whole bunch of varieties like that. Lupins get a lupin aphid. It's specific to lupins. Lupins are a beautiful plant. We have plenty in the yard that will get lupin aphids early in the spring usually. Populations of predators build up on that lupin spread out to the rest of the yard. So I am not doing anything except for planting a variety of plants and that's how I'm controlling my aphids and that's how you can do it too. Mm -hmm.